All right, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for Kai's baptism and salvation. We just give you praise. And Lord, we're just excited about what you're doing in this place. Thank you for including us. And I just pray this morning that your words speak to us and transform us and step by step more into your image as we seek you and seek your kingdom. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. 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 Well, we've been in, I learned from Pastor Joe how to do a long series. And we're in a series of loving the lost, reaching the lost. In Matthew chapter 9, 37, Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. Therefore, and the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into that harvest. And, and we're the answer to that prayer. We pray it. We ask God. And then he says, yes, and you're the answer to that as well. And last week, we talked about the conversion of Lydia. And it was great to see how God is just working this plan. See, this, you know, we don't realize sometimes life feels chaotic, right? But it's not to Jesus. Because he's working this divine plan, and, and he gave them kind of a, a divine detour. They wanted to go this way, and the Holy Spirit's like, nope. And well, how about this way, Lord? And nope. And they had to obey those no's first before they got the direction of where to go. And so they listened to the Holy Spirit, and they're like, okay. And, and God sent them way out of the way. And, and Paul had a good plan. There was nothing wrong with God's plan. It's kind of a cliche nowadays, but it's still true. You know, it's, it can be good, but it's not God, right? You know, we've all heard that. And that's kind of a, it's, it's a good cliche. That's why people use it. It's, you know, there's good plans and then there's God plans. Amen. And so we yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so God leads him to this city in Philippi. And, and so he told them no. Then he told them where. And then he, they got there and then he didn't say anything. Right? See, because sometimes... God's like, okay, and you're like, well, Lord, all right, I'm not getting a no, and I'm not getting a where, so then Paul's like, well, let's just, we suppose there were some people down by the water praying, so they went there, and, and it worked. They led Lydia and her family to the Lord, and it wasn't exactly what they expected yet, because God said, uh, the man from Macedonia, the vision, and said, there's this guy, you know, and so far, it's all just ladies getting saved, not all well, ladies, not just ladies getting in trouble here. It's these wonderful women by the water, these awesome ladies, no dudes yet. And so he went down there. And, but what I see is it didn't look like what he expected, but God was orchestrating this divine plan. And I love the fact that Lydia, it tells us, it goes out, the, the Bible tells us Lydia was from this place where Paul was told not to go. And it's all... Like, God was like, hey, no, Lydia's not there. I need you guys to talk to Lydia. And so, like, he had a divine appointment for Paul and, and, and Silas and Lydia and her family. And, and Peter went over there. So God's got it covered. We don't need to worry. He's got it covered. But he has this divine plan. You know, like we used to say all the time here in, in back in the day, we're in the right place at the right time. I reason. Amen. Amen. So let me tell you, God does not have you here by accident. Amen. We need to lock into his purpose. Sometimes we don't see it, but let me tell you, he's, God has never said, oops. I mean, sometimes, you know, you met somebody and you're like, are you sure you never said oops? No, I'm just kidding. That's kidding. Right. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I've looked in the mirror and I'm like, you sure? You didn't be like, well, what was that about, right? No, he never has said that. He's orchestrating this divine plan, and all we've got to do is kind of link into that. And uh, so let's move on to today because I want to get to the Macedonian man because we, Paul, Paul does meet him. And so the story picks up the account. Sometimes I don't like saying the word story. It is a story, but it's a true story. The true story as it picks up in Acts chapter 16, they're just walking down to the place of prayer. And as they were, there was this, this fortune teller girl who was a slave. And as they would, she would go by and they would say, these are the men of God who proclaim the way of salvation. 
And so he kept doing it after a few days. And after a while, Paul got kind of sick of it. He's like, he's like, uh, you know, this is annoying. He didn't really want a demon-possessed person on his resume, I guess. Is, is, you, you know, he's like, no, this, I don't need that. So let me, you know, this is, I, you know, the, the, mess, the, the messenger is just as important as the message. And, uh, right? Amen? And sometimes it can be truth, but he didn't, want to, he, didn't want, he didn't need demons to speak for him, I guess is what I want to say. And so he's just like, you know what? Come out of her in Jesus' name. And that demon gets cast out of this lady, this girl. And she is set free, so set free. She's like, her, her, her little gift of fortune telling is gone. And her owners were like mad. And so they create this turmoil. And that's when they lock them up and throw them into prison. And I want to pick up the story there. So let's go to Acts chapter 16, verse 19. But when their owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. And the crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrate tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them and threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So the inner prison would be that kind of most secure of the secure prison, Sometimes there was two or three sections of the prison, and that innermost was the darkest, it was the coldest, it was the dampest, there was no light. Sometimes they would put people in the inner prison that they just didn't care if they died. They just put them in there because these ones don't matter. And then on top of that, he put them in stocks. And usually when we see stocks, you think of like the guy, you know, cowboys, you know, and like that. Uh, it just says their feet was in this, were in the stocks. And it wasn't stocks like you see, like just like next to each other, like that. What they would do with the Roman stocks is make it as comfortable, uncomfortable as possible. So they spread it out, and so you're sitting there on the f- cold floor with your feet in stocks and in pain. And so probably couldn't even sit up very well. They probably had to lay back on the cold floor. So they're being tortured, and it doesn't say that they were. The guard was told to do that. That's just what he did. Okay. Now, this story of the Philippian jailer, the man from Macedonia, is one of my favorite stories in the New Testament. I love it. And if you're like me, how many, like, heard this in children's church, right? When you were a kid, some of you, how many didn't? No, all right. How many, like, oh, yeah, that's, I forgot. We don't, I don't raise my hand no matter what he says, right? (laughs) That's right. I forgot about y'all. So... But uh, if you don't raise your hand, would you raise your hand and tell me just who doesn't raise their hand here? Okay, that's right. All right. Trick question. So, <clears throat> all right. It's always like I heard that joke 29,000 times, Dad. Please stop. But so this is one of my favorite stories. But when you hear these, these classic accounts, it's so important we don't get numb to what God is doing there because this is an amazing story. This, what, this, what happened here in the book of Acts is mind-blowing amazing to me. And so I want to go through this. And, and I'll tell you this, too. When you read the book of Philippians, think of this story. Because it has so much more impact. Actually, I would say this. Today, go home. You got one more fasting thing, right? So, you know, or two more meals left, right? If, if, depending on whatever you're fasting. One more day of fasting. Read Philippians and think about what happened in that jail. Because the words have so much more impact. And I have a couple passages from Philippians, and you're going to be like, oh, wow, that, that is amazing. But I love reading the context in Acts of the epistles. It makes them so much more powerful. But anyway, all right, so they're beaten up. They're in stocks. They're in pain. It's awful. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas are praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. About midnight. Now, I don't know what was happening at 1130. I don't know if they had to really work it up to get there. I don't think so, though. 
I don't know what was happening an hour before, but at midnight, these guys are praying. They're worshiping. And what are they praying for? Is he praying, Lord, get me out of here? I don't, I don't think so. What is he praying? Lord, save these people. Save them. Use us in this place. I'm going to circle around back to that. But he's praying for something. And he's worshiping. They're praising God. They're giving glory to God. And they're having a terrible day. <laughs> right? I mean, it's awful. I have not had a day that bad. But I've had days that were bad enough to make me not feel like praising. I've had times when I didn't because I felt sorry for myself. Not you guys, just me though, right? Because I know none of you ever did anything like that. But so anyway, they're praying and they're worshiping. And this is, this is exciting. Verse 26. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were stricken, shaken, and immediately the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice. He said, do yourself no harm. We're all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, trembling with fear. And he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Oh, man. He said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once with his family. And he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And they rejoiced all along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Man, that is amazing. I, you know, sometimes the LA, I'm like, man, I want to see salvations like that. But then I think about it, oh, there's a little prison thing involved in that. What if we became a people that didn't care? We can be. Anyway, I'm jumping ahead of myself a little bit. I want to point out some things. The first of all, the first one is this supernatural love. This supernatural love that's going on. I mean, this is not just... You know where sometimes people say love is a choice? And I believe that, I think. I believe that. Uh, I, I believe that. I think there's more than a choice thing going on here. I mean, unless he's got like some massive willpower. There's something deeper than that. It's supernatural love. There's, there's a love that we get when we're with Jesus. You can't get it from preaching. You can't get it from hearing my sermon. You can get it from you getting alone with Jesus. And just, just getting in that deep place. That's where that supernatural love comes from. Because they're wounded, they're beaten, they're in the stocks. And we do see somebody without hope. It's not Paul and Silas. It's this guy that's about to take his own life. They're praising, they're praying, they're worshiping. This guy's like, oh. Because he knew if everybody had escaped, he's a dead man. And it might not be pleasant. We saw that happen with Peter, Remember? The soldiers that let him out, they got killed. They were executed. It's a death sentence. And listen, all they had to do was nothing. That's not what Paul did. He shouted out. He said the guy drew his sword, and all they had to do to get out of that place was nothing. This is how I know he wasn't praying to get out. Or at least not the main part of his prayer. Because if he had been like, Lord, get me out of here. Please, I trust you until you get me out of here. Please get me out. Please get me out. And then that happened, he would have been like, thank you very much. <laughs> Peace, right? He had been out. That would have been, right? I mean, right? 
So I'm thinking maybe he prayed that because he did pray to get out of jail. We can pray to get out of jail. We can pray to get out of situations. That's okay. We're not masochists, right? But he must have been praying something else too. I think he was praying for souls. I think he was like, Lord, use us to reach these people. Lord, even save that soldier who just put me in these stocks. And this hurts. He didn't have to do that. They just said, put him in prison. He didn't have to put us in the inner prison. I don't know, you know. Lord, save him. Lord, you love him so much. Save him. They could have just said, well, he deserved it. They could have said, and it would have seemed like true, God set us free. That would have seemed true. But he didn't. He said, don't harm yourself. We're all here. I mean, can you imagine the scene? Like, this doesn't happen with normal people. Old Testament, man, kill them all, right? You know, this is something new. This is this love and grace that is like amazing and world changing. And so he, he's like, do not hurt yourself, mean, evil jailer who just put me in stocks. He didn't say that, but that's who he is. He's like, don't hurt yourself. We're all here. This freedom, the chains coming off. You know what? These chains came, in off, came off, not for Paul and Silas, for the jailer. Amen. Amen. And then the guy comes over. He's shaking. He's like, what do I, what do, I do to be saved? What, just tell me. I'm in. Whatever it is, I'm in because he saw something tremendous, which was the love of God flowing through a couple of guys, faith and hope like he had never seen before. In the midst of terrible situation, he's like, ah, what do I do? Listen, Philippians, and this will mean more to you now, I think. Because this is the letter he wrote to the people, the soldier. You know, he gets saved, right? So Paul writes this letter to Philippians. The soldier is there when it's being read. Everybody knows this story of how their church was founded very, very well. Him and Lydia are like the founding leaders of this church. All right, right? So Philippians 129. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others." Can you tell me, like, how much power those words carry with somebody you just saw live it out to the max? I mean, he says, the conflict that you saw, right? He said, have that same love. See, the world don't need preachers that preach great things that they don't live. The world don't need Christians talking about faith that they don't have. But man, man, when they see believers that live what we believe, wow, that's world changing. That's world changing. Because let me tell you something, the world is watching us. They're watching. And I don't think always, like something we think, they're watching us, waiting for me to make a mistake. I don't think, I don't think it's always that way. I think sometimes we worry about that too much. I just think they're looking for something that's real. There's so much fake out there. Everybody knows there's a lot of fake out there, but they don't know how to find the real. They want something real. 
like when I read a story of, like, of somebody or I use a quote or something like that, I always, most times I'll look up that person because I want to see how they finished. I'm like, man, please, I hope they didn't turn like, you know, something or stole money or did, the, you know what I mean? I, I'm like, I just want to see somebody that finished well. I want to see somebody who lived it. And they're watching us, and I think they're looking for hope. They're looking for the real deal. And we might not realize it. Like, we don't know. But like our coworkers, people are in our circles. They know. They heard us one time talk a little bit about church. Or they saw that bumper sticker or something, right? They know. We might not know that they're watching us. I don't think necessarily Paul and Silas were really thinking about the guys watching. I think they were too preoccupied, too pressing in with prayer and worship and praising God. But the earth shakes, the doors bust open, the chains fall off, and nobody moved. So, I mean, I get like, okay, we get like Paul and Silas had this really great love they had a heart for the people and for the soldier. So I get why they didn't move, but everybody else didn't move. All these guys are in prison. Some of them, maybe they're going to get executed. It was serious. Now's their opportunity. Nobody moved, right? Their eyes were fixed on Paul and Silas, and they're watching. Okay, let's see what's next. Because, like, these guys got something. Now this crazy thing happens. I want to I wanna watch this out to the end, baby. You got me, right? You got me. I'm telling you, that happens with us. That happens with us. The world sees that calamity head our way. They see us stay in hope, stay in faith, go deeper, and they're like, let me see how long this lasts. Is this real? This can't be real. This can't be real. And they're watching Oh, you know what? Let me tell you something. They're going to be turning. <laughs> They're watching us. What are we doing with our opportunity? The opportunity to maybe rejoice in the middle of suffering, to still be in love with Jesus in the middle of a trial. Right? To choose somebody else's freedom over our own. Because that's what he did. He's like, you're going to get free. God broke this jail open because somebody's getting free today. It's you, man. Because he went and went to the house, but then went back. Someone else's freedom. First Peter 4.12 says this. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in so far as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice to be glad when his glory is revealed. See, you know what? He gets glorified in it, and we get to celebrate in that. You know, he said in, in Philippians, he says, it is granted to you. Like, here's a gift. Thanks a lot. <laughs> this gift of suffering, but it was because something really, really great was going to be worked out of that. And here's the plain truth. Suffering happens anyway, right? So it's not like having a good attitude is going to make more suffering happen. It's not like loving Jesus through it is going to make it happen more. It's not like praising Jesus through it is going to make it happen more. But it will make us different and it will change the lives of those watching us. You know, I wonder if Paul was thinking about this scripture when he was worshiping. I mean, he knew the Bible pretty good. Psalm 119, 61 says this. Listen to this. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight, I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. I'm a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O oh Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. Can you imagine? He's like, well, they got me. But you know what? I'm getting up at midnight to praise the Lord. 
<laughs> you know what? Because when, when, when God is there, when the presence of God is there, the, a prison can be a cathedral. Amen? Psalm, Psalm 1611 says this, you, show, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. There is a deep place. There is a deep place in God's presence that surpasses our circumstances. We know that. Our circumstances can always be taken away. But the presence of God is, cannot be taken away from us. There's a great book out there, The Heavenly Man, uh, about Brother, um, oh gosh, what was his name? Brother, I forget his name, Young, Yan, I think. But about his time of imprisonment in China. And he talked about how some of his best times with the Lord were during those imprisonment years where he just was like, just felt so close to God because he, he had no other choice. It's like, I'm just going to press in and, and worship the Lord. You know, let's look at their suffering. I mean, they didn't have a court case. They were just thrown in there. Their, tr their treatment was completely unjust. Is that fair? Nope. Nope. You know, it's not fair when a soldier goes and lays down his life for his country. Is that fair? How many of you know somebody who's done that? You know, it's not fair. But they do it for a higher purpose. And they're honored for it. You know, when we understand our purpose, it changes everything. 1 Peter 2.20 says this, What credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it and you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to do this, you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. So I know, like, I don't, you know, like preaching on suffering. But there is such power when we lean into Jesus. Paul understood it, that his purpose was right there. Right in the middle of that prison. He's like, there is purpose in here. So I know he was, he was praying for salvation. Not just his own freedom. Because he talks about that in, his, in Philippians. It's not just about us. It's about other people. And like, they're like, oh, Yep. <laughs> that's that's Paul. <laughs> that's Paul. You know the door's open. That's why he was about to. You know, that's why he was his re, his gut reaction, because that happened fast, right? Doors open. Jail is like, whoosh, and and jail didn't even look to see if they were in there. This is happening fast, and Paul's gut reaction is like, "Don't hurt yourself," because it was already deep in his heart that love for that bad guy. Remember Paul's vision? 400 miles away, the man from Macedonia pleading, I believe, was this jailer. This is the first guy and the only one really notable in the whole story in Macedonia, the first one to become born again. He was pleading in the vision but didn't even know it in, in regular life. It wasn't like Cornelius. But God's like, this guy right here, I'm sending you to him. God put that around and allowed or directed, however it makes you feel better at night. <laughs> but Paul ended up in that prison so that that guy could be born again. See, sometimes what it looks like the enemy is winning, it's not. It's God orchestrating a divine plan for an awesome testimony. Remember, I was thinking way back, many moons ago, when Joanna was pregnant with our first baby, Danny. He's a big guy right now. See Danny? Everyone wave at Danny. Hi, Danny. <laughs> uh, and, and we went to the Lamaze classes. You ever do those? So just for the first one, we went to Lamaze class and and so on the last day, they have, they show you a video of, of a live birth. So I brought snacks. Popcorn and cookies. 
all the all the women and Joanna were all looking like, what is wrong with you? All the dudes were like, bro, thank you, bro, where to go? <laughs> Got this. So I didn't have any snacks at her delivery, just so you know. But anyway, I'm not stupid. But anyway, one thing they drilled into our heads, they said, ladies, you got to understand this. It's pain, but it's pain with a purpose. Christians, we got to understand this. There is some pain. It's pain with a purpose. And let me tell you, the eternal reward for that pain is so greater than the actual pain that we go through. Right? Because the, the pain is going to be taken away, but the souls will not. The testimony goes on. Yeah, you can clap for that. Amen? So I think sometimes we live in, the, you know, kind of like that metaphor, pain, that labor. We kind of live in like a metaphorical perpetual labor sometimes, right? It's like, oh, because we forget the purpose. Let's move this thing to delivery, right? Let's deliver this thing. Let's know that this thing is not going to be forever. Let's get to the purpose that God wants to work. Let's lift up our eyes. Say, God, what, what do you want to do in this place? Because we waste our trials when we don't pray and worship God right through them. When we don't let him open our eyes to it. I mean, what if all that Paul and Silas did was sulk? Is sulking a sin? I guess a little bit. It can't be one of the big ones. I'm pretty sure like you know, uh, murder is more. <laughs> I think lying is worse. I think, I think there's a lot of things worse than, than, than sulking. But sulking would have been, I don't know, if the earthquake would have still happened. I don't know, it feels kind of connected to the worship, doesn't it? And then if it did, I, I don't think if he was sulking, he would have yelled to stop that guard from killing himself. I'll tell you what, he definitely would not have been born again, and neither would his family and all them other prisoners. Just from, this sucks. (laughs) I don't deserve this. I just, the camera people are not used to me being down here. Sorry, guys, I messed you up there. Just be on your toes. (laughs) This stinks, man. I'm just doing God's work, and now everybody appreciates it. Don't they know who I am? I'm like the most loving guy around, and they... Right? That's all they had to do is just feel sorry for themselves, and a whole bunch of people would have gone to hell. What? Don't make it sound like that, John. Come on, you make it so dramatic. It's kind of important. It's kind of important. Right? And Paul would have still been saved. He still would have been going to heaven. We're still saved by grace. We always fall short. And then he gives us another opportunity to get it right. And that's so great. I lost my place. Okay. I bet you all them prisoners, they all got saved too. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Granted. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort and love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord. And we don't do it out of selfish ambition. It's not about ourselves, lifting up others higher than ourselves. You know, I, I could see when this is being read, I, like I'm a very... I imagine a lot in my head. I'm very, just, you know, I have a a lot of imagination going on in there. 
So if you see me staring off into space, I'm just in my own little happy place. But this is what I see. I see this letter being read to the Philippian church. I see the Philippian jailer sitting there and his wife and his kids. They're right on the front row. His wife's sitting next to Lydia. And as he reads his part, he says, count others more than yourselves. I see Lydia kind of look over at the jailer's wife and I'm like, yeah. I see the jailer with a tear going down his eye saying, yeah. He did that. I'm so grateful. It's so powerful. The Bible calls it a light affliction for a moment compared to the weight of glory that will be revealed in us. And they got to see some of that on this side of eternity, but there's so much more on the other side. It's amazing. It's a gift. I have a friend, you can put a picture up there of my friend in the hospital, Jim Pelletier. He just got a liver transplant, and he is not, he wasn't from drinking or anything. He just, he just had a bad liver and was, was dying and, and got a transplant. And he's in the hospital, and his wife posted this picture. He's like, she's basically said, this is what's happening all the time. This Jim is just loving on everybody. He's talking about Jesus to everybody. He can't feel good. I never had a liver transplant, but I've heard it hurts. I heard that leading up to it's pretty painful. Kind of messes with you, right? But he's like, oh, man, every time I see his pictures, and I texted him this morning, and he's praying with people and talking about Jesus and giving them hope. And I'll tell you what I know. I've done a lot of funerals. I've been to a lot of hospitals. And I've had nurses and funeral directors tell me this. He says, when the Christians come in here, it's different. They're all like full of hope and they're like, God's got this. And they're full of faith. And then in the funerals, because man, a funeral without hope, let me tell you, that's awful. I've done them. I've had funerals where nobody was saved. It was not fun. I still preach Jesus to them, I'll tell you that. I preach the hope of the resurrection. Because there's still hope for them. But I'll tell you what, man. The world is watching. And this trial can become an opportunity. His liver needed swapped out anyway. Might as well make something good of it. It says in, I think, Psalms, when you extract what is precious from what is vile, you become like God's mouth. Extract is some precious thing hidden in there. God places these opportunities in the most unlikely places, right in the middle of our mess. God gets the glory. I got this video I want you to see. It's just a couple of minutes, but it's just so powerful. Watch this. Ten-year-old Willie Myrick loves playing the drums, something he hopes one day to do at his church. Born to atheist parents, Willie was raised by his godmother, Codetta Bateman, who took him to church. It was there that he learned about God and developed a passion for the Bible. Pastor, he talks about, like, different scriptures, and we're on Genesis 31 now. But he tells us a little stuff about him, and he goes over it every Sunday. Codetta says she's seen Willie's faith blossom over the years. Faith is important to this house and, and everything, and, and believing in God is important. So I should, you know, in this house, we go to church. He know God, he know Jesus. While most kids his age are busy playing video games, Willie spends his free time studying the Word of God. His favorite scripture? Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He says God is his best friend. I always think that God is with me everywhere I go. Like when I'm in bed, he has a chair, he's just watching. CBN News got a taste of his love for memorizing the books of the Bible. Okay, ready? Go. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. In April, while playing with his dog in the front yard of his Atlanta home, Willie came face to face with a kidnapper. 
putting his childlike faith to the test. Some guy came up in a silver, silver or gray hundo cord, man tussled me in the car. He man tussled you in the car. Willie says he wanted to yell for help, but the man covered his mouth. Traumatized, Willie feared for his life. Cursing, cursing, cursing. I was thinking that he's going to hurt me bad, bad, real bad. Thrown into the back of a locked car, Willie's fear soon gave way to faith in the form of a gospel song he learned at church. He began singing it in the back seat. God's my deliverer. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Every prayer, every prayer is to our God. The popular song, Every Praise, by Grammy Award-winning artist Hezekiah Walker is one of Willie's favorites. I knew it by heart. I sang it, the whole thing by heart. And God, if you praise the, if you praise the Lord, he'll help you in a mysterious way. Despite repeated threats, Willie sang nonstop while the man drove around for three hours. I was just sing singing passion and pride, so I didn't care what, what happened. Agitated by the constant singing, the man eventually let Willie out of the car. He was shaken but unharmed. I guess he was mad, so he dropped me off. Willie ran to a nearby home and called his godmother. Willie's story made headlines around the world, leading to talk show appearances like Arsenio Hall. He even got the chance to perform his song of deliverance with Walker. While he's enjoying being in the media spotlight, he says he's just an ordinary kid who serves an extraordinary God. It really doesn't matter to me. As long as I still have Jesus and he's still working, doing his little magic, well, it's not magic, it's just power. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Man, that kid, he praised God to freedom. And even more than that, his story is being told. And God turned some attack of the enemy into a testimony for Jesus. Your attitude in the middle of that tough situation, that trial, that suffering, let me tell you something, it could bring freedom all around us. Amen? Amen. 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 See, defined moments, they're hidden inside. They're hidden inside. And we can embrace them. Let's stand. Let me tell you, that praise, it does break chains. But it's not just singing a song it's that faith it's that it's that something with jesus that connects us to singing that song amen, amen. and i'm telling you there's deep places we can go there's deep places we can go in jesus we can get that supernatural love that it's not going to be faked it's developed it's not it's it's deeper than just deciding. It's deeper than that. It's more powerful than that. It's, it's an impartation of having been with Jesus. I just want to encourage you. Let's go deep. I want one last scripture to read to you. In Philippians 1.9, this is the Philippian church. Paul said, It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for that day is Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise to God. I want to be like, I want to go deep. I want to have that love, that faith, that praise. That no matter, listen, stuff happens. It happens Sometimes God intervenes and stops it, and sometimes he lets us go through it. We don't always have a choice. But we can choose to press into those deep places and let God redeem it into this amazing testimony. How many want that? Lord, I just pray in Jesus' name. Bring us deep. Give us great faith. 
May we be a people that press into those places that experience your transformation, that we can have full of faith and praise you in our circumstances and watch you do tremendous miracles. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Our prayer team is up front here if you would like prayer. If you don't know Jesus and you want to know Jesus, come on right up front and we'll pray with you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we just praise you. Thank you, Jesus.